less than root x, less than equal root x. And now for um, ones that have been crossed out three times, it was crossed out three times, then put back three times for three choose two, so we need to cross it out again. And this reminds us of the Mobius one. Minus 1 to the r if n is the product of r distinct primes and is 0 if it has a, a repeated prime factor. U of n will count the number of primes. Okay, so that's, that's what we've counted up. And what we've come up with, if we define as usual y of x to be the prime counting function of x, we've come up with what is known as Legendre's formula, um, or at least a special case of it. We've, we've recorded the primes up to x other than those up to root x, and we also kept the integer 1. And that messy thing here is more compactly described using the Mobius function as follows. Okay, so the, what do we do? We want to estimate the number of primes up to x. Well, we're lucky. The number of primes up to root x is certainly less than the number of integers up to root x. And we're lucky because it turns out the number of primes up to x is much bigger than that. So this left side really is a good approximation to pi of x. Unfortunately, with the integer part function, about all we can do, IQ, come on in, um, is, is replace the integer part of x over d by x over d. So that when we do that, we, make, we pull out the x and we make a, an error of what we'll call the remainder. And that remainder is just what we get from the fractional parts because we've replaced the integer part over d by
the major turn, as I said, is something we hope is small. Okay, there are a million examples where you can set up more problems and other interesting problems in terms of this terminology. Of course, that doesn't mean you solve the problem, as we all know. So here are some just three quick basic examples if we take A to be the characteristic function. From it. Usually this, uh, the characteristic function is uh, usually it's just a characteristic function of an interesting set, but I, I said it was a sequence of non-negative reals. So A is the characteristic function of these Ns, and you might as well say N is even to start with, but you don't need to. In this case, G of P happens to be 2 over P if P is congruent to 1 mod 4 and 0 otherwise, and the remainder of P is less than or equal to. And we can certainly see that if we can sit up to square root X in this example, we prove and get something positive coming out, we prove they're infinite with many primes to the form N squared plus 1. Similarly, we can try and get twin primes by looking at products N times N minus 2, and if we could sit up to the fourth root of X, then we get twin primes. Another way to try and get twin primes is just to start with the sequence of shifted primes, P minus 2, where P runs through primes. In this case, G of D is, 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 is the order function, one of the reciprocal of the order function phi of D, and the number of multiples ADX is connected with the number, it's just the number of primes on X in the residue class P modulo D. And so the remainder term here will be connected with the order term in the prime of two for the number of conditions. I believe again that this is the number of twin primes. Okay, now I want to go back again to the genres formula, which I'll repeat. So the first two lines are just for repetition, but I just didn't want to have to undo everything my own transparency that I was up here. And similarly, this is the basic formula for the Mobius function. And now our idea, or Ren's idea, rather, is we're going to replace the Mobius function by sequences of functions, new sequences, lambda d plus and lambda d minus. And when we look at the summatory function of the lambda d plus, it's going to give us something which is bigger than this guy, bigger or equal this guy. And when we look at the summatory function of the lambda d minuses, that's going to give us something that's less than or equal this guy. And now if we go through the same manipulation exactly we went through here, at some place where we had an equal sign, we're going to have a less than or equal sign. And so what we get are upper and lower bounds for this thing we're trying to estimate. So we get an upper bound for what we want and a lower bound for what we want. And these guys look just the same as these guys did, except instead of the Mobius function, we have these new sequences, lambdas. Well, the main point of all this is we had a trouble with this remainder term, u of d. And the reason we had trouble with it is it went on forever. It went, it went, it go, the Mobius function is something that was given to us when we were born, although we didn't recognize it at the time. And it's just there. But when you invent your own sequences, you can say, OK, I don't want these sequences to live forever. I want them to stop at a certain point. And if they stop at a certain point, then this remainder term stops. It just stops. OK, well, uh, unlike the Mobius function, that's one unique creature. Well, are there any of these lambda d pluses and lambda d minuses? Maybe they don't exist. Well, actually, there are, and there are tons of them. So how do we choose them? In the case of Run, at least in the case of his first sieve, we choose them like this. If we want an upper bound, we go as we did before, and then we just stop after an even point. If we want a lower bound, we go as we did before, and then after the number prime factors get gets to this point, we stop. So that's just the same story over again. OK, well, finally, I should say that I'm going to skip some history now. This was Brun's early sieve, earliest sieve, and he went on and he worked on it, and he refined it quite a bit and obtained quite a bit stronger results than this one did. Oh, this one was already strong enough to give some very nice applications. And then there was this school working on it, especially in, in the Soviet Union. And uh, But we'll skip it anyway. And because it is the eighth transparency, and eventually we should get to Silver. So Silver's first work on this was his upper bound sieve, which people sometimes call the lambda square sieve. The reason will become apparent very quickly. And uh, Silver was motivated to look at this sieve because of the work he'd been doing earlier on the Riemann zeta function. And it turned out that some innovations he used there, somewhat surprisingly, at least at first glance, uh, turned out to be very useful for, uh, for sieve methods as well. So let's start off. Let's take any sequence rho d, where d divides p of z, any sequence of reals uh, supported on the divisors of this product of up to z, and we'll insist that row 1 equals 1, and that row d stops at a certain point. Uh, it might be the same z as here, or more generally, we could have it stop at a later point than z. And then for any n, we have the following inequality. This is Selberg's great mileage maker. Squares of real numbers are greater or equal 0. Row of 1 is 1, so you get the top line, and row is are real, so you get the bottom line. OK, so that means we can just plug this in, where we plugged the lambda before. And this is automatically an upper bound sieve, no matter what the rows are. If I square this out and interchange the order of summation, it looks like this. That looks a little like the formula we had before, except we had something with a single sum over d. Actually, this is what we had before. And this doesn't look at instantly of the same form, but if you think about it a minute or less or more, you'll see that it is of that form if we write the lambda d plus as this sum where we group the pairs, the products of the pairs, whose, le whose least common multiple is d. This is least the square brackets are least common multiple. And if this thing stops beyond z or stops beyond w, then this thing certainly stops beyond z squared or beyond w squared. And that's uh, this d at which these coefficients stop, we're going to call the level of the sieve. OK, now if I, if I look at uh, this guy here, if I look at it in this form, 
or in this form. And I, now I want to plug in my approximation, I guess in this form, I want to plug in my approximate formula for a sub x as a main term and a remainder term. And here's what the main term is going to look like. And now this is a quadratic form in these real numbers row d. And this is going to be an upper bound sieve. And we have an upper bound sieve, and this is the main term, so we want to minimize this quadratic form. And this can be solved. This, uh, the way we can start up, I saw, is, is we can diagonalize this form. Uh, I, you, maybe you can verify these things in your head. I can't, even though I've been seeing them for 40 years. Um, we define the following function, h of d. It's this product over these g's, uh, over the primes of this rational function of the g's. And then we introduce new variables y in terms of the rows using this function. This is the Mobius function. I don't know if it looks like it. Yeah, sort of. OK. And then applying a, not, the most, not the first Mobius inversion formula you learn, but the second one, you can get the rows back in terms of the y's. And now, if you look at, if you plug this in our quadratic form here, using this, turn diagonalizes to look like this. So this, these h's, because the g's are between 0 and 1, the h's are certainly positive. So this is a positive definite quadratic form in a certain number of variables, maybe a large number of variables, but it's a positive definite form. And it's got a constraint. You may forget what the constraint was. Row 1 was equal to 1. Now we've got this in terms of the y's. And if we substitute, if we make the same substitution here, we get the following hyperplane. So the problem has become to minimize that quadratic form subject to that constraint. Now, Silberg had started studying university mathematics at the age of 12, so he certainly knew how to use Lagrange multipliers. There are other ways to do this, but that's the way he did. And the final result, using the normalizations he used, uh, some people use slightly different substitutions to diagonalize this, but using the ones he used, it comes out with a very simple cute answer. If we let h be the sum, remember that these are only going up to capital D, these are finite sums, then the minimum turns out to be h inverse, and each of the variables turn out to be h inverse. So that's a, that's a nice normalization he used. And if we plug back in to get the rows in terms of the, of the, uh, of the y's, then we come up with this, which is no longer looking quite so simple. OK, so now there are, this have, uh, caused quite a stir when it was introduced in the late 40s, partly because Silbert was already on top of the world. Um, a lot of the applications of the sieve still come from Brun's sieve. Uh, you don't need Selberg's sieve, but there were a lot of new ones. So, for example, Brun, not using the first sieve I described, but using somewhat more complicated, his later ones, which are really complicated so in some sense, he, he gave the following bound for the number of primes in a short interval from x to x plus y. So you should think of y as maybe being, for example, root x or something like that, or x to the one third. That's what is most useful, this bound. And you get an upper bound of the right order of magnitude. Now, so using Selberg's upper bound sieve, you could show that any c greater or equal to will do the trick. Now, Selberg, as he writes in, in some of his later papers, spent a long time, well, spent some time trying to improve this constant, too, because he knew it would have important other applications. The two is some sort of, in a sense, a natural boundary that if you can, if you can beat it, then you can do some wonderful other things. But actually, he was never able to do that. And this, but thinking about this led him to his next, one of his next themes in sieve theory, uh, trying, to de trying to decide what you could and couldn't do with the sieve. What, what were the limitations, in general, of what you could do with the sieve? And he found specific limitations, and he referred to this as the parity principle. So uh, he constructed a number of important counterexamples which showed that there were certain things you could not do using the sieve axioms. And here are the simplest counterexamples. Yeah, suppose you take your set A to be not the integers of text, but just those that have an even number of prime factors. So recall, u of n is the number of distinct prime factors. Well, if u of n is always even in the sequence, then the sequence has no primes. That seems pretty self-evident. But it turns out that you can show that this sequence satisfies the basic sieve axioms that people have been using to the same extent, to the greatest possible extent, to the same extent that all the integers of text satisfy. Now, there are things that all the set of integers of text satisfy that aren't satisfied by this set, but they weren't things that were being used in the sieve, not till about 30 years after this, 20 years after this. So that showed that you weren't going to produce primes just in a sequence from the sieve, just using these axioms. Well, you can just change this a little and take the set of all integers of text, which have an odd number of prime factors. Well, if you stop and think about it, what you expect for such a sequence, this thing actually contains twice as many primes as you expect. I mean, it's half as many integers as a set of integers of text, but it's got just as many primes as the set of integers of text. So it's twice what you should expect, what it should. Well, there are many other more complicated examples. While Selberg was thinking about this, he came up with what he called the local sieve, which uh, it, it's named that for a technical reason. Uh, no, it, it, it's not important why he called it a local sieve. Anyway, let's, let's go to the von Mangold function. So this is the usual von Mangold function. You can generalize the von Mangold function in a very natural way to what I'll call lambda, what people call lambda 2 of n. And instead of this thing, instead of living on the prime powers, lives on the integers with less than or equal to two prime factors. And actually, the way uh, I'll just tell you that one way of looking at this as a generalization is to say this is the convolution of the, the directly convolution of the Mobius function and the logarithm. This is the directly convolution of the Mobius function and the square of the logarithm. You now know what the generalization is. Okay. Well, it's been known forever that the prime number theorem is equivalent to the fact that this sum is asymptotic to x, equivalent in the sense that either is easier to prove, either is easier to prove from the other than it is to prove from scratch. And Selberg showed the similar asymptotic formula. That's two x log x if you can't read it. The similar asymptotic formula for this sum. But whereas this one is hard.
hard to prove, using elementary means at least. This one is fairly easy to prove. Analytically, this guy comes from a Dirichlet series with a simple pool. This guy comes from a Dirichlet series with a double pool. There are all sorts of reasons analytically where you can prove bad things don't happen twice. So that translates into an elementary proof of this. And from this, he was able to deduce elementary proofs of Dirichlet theorem and of the prime number theorem. And Ergush, as we know, also deduced a proof of the prime number theorem. Later, Bombieri generalized this and really turned it into a very beautiful part of the subject. Uh, that's maybe when Bombieri has his 70th birthday. I can talk on uh, Yeah, right. <laughs> when somebody else has their 55th birthday, that's very good, right? Yeah, I don't need to wait for Enrico. OK, so now we haven't talked at all about lower bounds, so let's, let's move on. Um, now, recall that. Recall that the run lower bound was very symmetric. Uh, the run set was very symmetric between lower and upper bounds. In one case, you stopped after this guy. In the other case, you stopped after the next guy. Well, Selbig's was based on a square being greater or equal zero. There isn't any really natural analog of that for the lower bound set. But there is something very useful that came out of work of Bushdot in between the period that, uh, of run and Selberg. Uh, Bushdot did a lot of work on the sieve. And one of the simplest of his discoveries is something that's a very, very basic part of sieve theory to this day. Uh, it's called a certain identity. Uh, what we do is we introduce Two, we consider two different values of our z parameter, z1 less than z2, and consider the difference of the sifting functions. So this is just counting, or summing the a's, say, the, uh, counting the elements up, which survive up to z1, but don't survive up to z2. And that means each of those is knocked out for the first time by a prime, which is between z1 and z2. And we are going to group those in accordance with the prime that knocks them out. Now, what we get for this difference is then a sum over the primes, grouping with the prime. Now, what do we get in the set knocked out by p? We get the set of things a m, where m is divisible by p, but no smaller prime. If we call the set for given p, the set of a m that do that, then they're just the ones that are added up in here. The, the, these are the integers, which are multiples of that p, and these are the ones, because of the intercepting function, they have no smaller prime than p. So we get the following formula. Now, it turns out, quite generally, that this set a p satisfies, in any useful in any reasonable example, if a has a nice set of axioms that it satisfies, then the set AP does as well. Each of those do as well. So if we have an upper bound sieve for each of these, then because of this minus sign, we have a lower bound for this. Well, you say, yeah, but what about this guy? This guy's with a plus sign, so you need a lower bound for this. But Z1 is smaller than Z2. And if you are sieving only up to a little ways, then you can get something fairly accurate. For example, after the first step, you're just counting the odd integers. That you can do pretty well. After the first two steps, you're just counting the integers which aren't multiple of six. You can do that. Which are prime to six, I should say. So you can do that pretty well. So this, if Z1 is, it could be going to infinity, but not too quickly. This we can get pretty accurately. And if Selbridge shows us how to get upper bounds for all of these, we get a lower bound for this. OK, so that's the basic technique for using Selbridge to get lower bounds. OK, so let's put together what we get. Now. 